Yes, B, whenever you're ready. Hi, I'm Tim Mattel, clinical associate professor of history at NYU, and it is my honor and privilege today to be, interviewed, to be interviewing Lucas Kwame for the Richard Nixon Video Vault of Human Progress. Mr. Kwame, thank you for doing this with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Well, in undergraduate school, I was not at all certain about attending law school. But after reading about Yale and the flexibility of its curriculum, I decided that that was the law school I wanted to attend. I was not at all certain that I wanted to practice law after and uh, thought that the theoretical approach of Yale's law school would be most conducive to what I had wanted to accomplish during those three years. So what did you want to accomplish? Well, I really thought at that time I would probably, well, to go back a bit, uh, when I matriculated at SMU on a football scholarship, my hope was to play professional football for a few years, return to Beaumont, where I grew up, and get involved in politics. During the course of my undergraduate studies, I um, concluded that I would attempt to do that by uh, getting a PhD in anthropology, teaching a few years, and then getting involved in politics. Um, I was convinced by law professors that I got to know at SMU that a law degree might be more effective for a political career and therefore decided that I would go to law school. Well, it was a bit surprising when I arrived, having gone to SMU in Dallas. Uh, I had not visited the campus at the time I matriculated. I expected Yale to be very much as I subsequently learned Princeton was. So when I arrived in New Haven and saw that the Panther trials were going on in downtown New Haven, that was basically a ghetto on one side of Yale and a very industrial city, which was very different from what I expected. But I had just a wonderful three years at Yale. I loved it, absolutely. Um, please tell us about some of your friends at Yale Law School. Well, five of them were involved in the Watergate inquiry. That would have been uh, Hillary Clinton, Mike Conway, uh, Richard Porter, uh, and Larry Lucchino, in addition to myself. So obviously having known um, my classmates, uh, I guess Hillary was in a four-year program, but graduated with me. Uh, Porter was one year ahead of me. Mike Conway uh, uh, was in the same class, and I think Larry Lucchino was one year ahead. So I'd known them quite well from law school. Um, did you uh, get to know Bill Clinton? Yes, I came to know Bill and Hillary early on in my uh, law school career. In fact, I think it was my first year, it may have been the second, that uh, I was not returning to Beaumont for Thanksgiving, and my girlfriend was at uh, Brown University, and so she was coming to New Haven to celebrate Thanksgiving. And somehow I learned that Bill was, uh, was not going to be going home either. I think we were just talking in the cafeteria. So he invited uh, Yvonne, my now wife, and me to join uh, he and Hillary for Thanksgiving, uh, for the Thanksgiving meal. So that was, the think, the first time that I spent substantial time with, with them but I had certainly seen them around. I had classes with him, and um, he, of course, is a very gregarious and personable person. So I had spoken with him on many occasions, but only brief conversations. But after that Thanksgiving meal, we came to know each other much better. Did you know Clarence Thomas? Yes, I did, knew Clarence very well. Uh, he was a year behind me, but um, there, 
was a close relationship among the African American students at the law school. And uh, so there was a group of us, five or six, that did many things together, and Justice Thomas was among that group. How welcoming did you find the, the Yale community to um, you know, the people who were African American students? Very welcoming. It, it was just a tremendous experience all around. There, I think there were 17 black students in my class of around 180. Um, I had a great experience at SMU as well, but it was very, very different. I was in the second class of black students at SMU. I think there were three in the class before me and eight in the class that I attended. And um, I was with the second group of football player, black football players in Southwest Conference. So there had been one player, scholarship player the year before, and there were three of us that uh, signed to play in the conference that year, two at SMU and one at Baylor. So in the sense that there was a much larger African-American representation at Yale than there had been at SMU at the time that I matriculated there. Um, so, uh, and it was just uh, my African-American friends at Yale were just a tremendous group of people. And, uh, but Yale was great in so many ways, I mean, the, the school was small enough that one got to know most classmates and many, many of the professors. And so my relationship with my professors, with my classmates, both African American and otherwise, was fantastic. And I was lucky enough to have just a great roommate uh, my first year um, who uh, challenged me a great deal. We found most day we had many classes together, and our general routine was to study for a couple of hours and then get into discussions regarding the cases. And many nights we argued all night until we could find a professor the next morning to resolve whatever the difference was in our points of view. So it was just a tremendous experience, and particularly since I had not expected it to be so. I did not expect to enjoy law school, but consider it among the three best years of my life. So who was your roommate? Dan Johnson, who practices law now in San Francisco. He was with um, Morgan Lewis for a number of years. Uh, he has now commenced practice in his own firm. He did that about two years ago as retirement uh, the, the period uh, approached. Who were your favorite teachers at Yale Law School? Well, Guido Calabresi was certainly among uh, the greatest of my teachers. Uh, Marvin Charlestein, who I think spent his last years at NYU after teaching at Yale for a number of years. He was a tax and business finance professor at Yale. When I uh, started law school, I thought if I enjoyed anything, it would be constitutional law and jurisprudence and classes of that kind. But Geraldine, uh, business finance and tax courses were fabulous. Uh, so Professor Calabresi, um, Professor Baker, who was my advisor, you have to do a major paper at Yale, uh, who was a business professor as well. Jeffrey Hazard was a favorite of mine. Um, professor Black, I did not, Charles Black, I did not have classes with, but we became very good friends during uh, my time there. Professor Bicker and tax, I came to know very well. I came to know Professor Bickle to some extent, although he passed, I can't remember exactly when he passed away. That may have been my third year or somewhere around that time period. Yeah, and I finished in 73. Um, <clears throat> did you meet Mr. Doerr when you came to Yale? I did. Well, there was an organization called the Barristers Union, which was a moot court type organization at the trial level, uh, which I participated in with my roommate. We were partners in that 
in that moot trial. And um, somehow, I have forgotten what the process was, that some of us that got into the later rounds were selected to the board of Barristers Union, so I was on that board along with uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary and, and my roommate, and I think, and Mike Conway was on that, that board as well. And I think Hillary and Bill were in charge of uh, one of the Barristers Union trials and invited John Doerr to act as judge in that trial. Generally, the practice was in the later rounds, eminent judges and lawyers were invited to act as judges, and they selected John Doerr to act in the trial that they organized. So I met him in connection with that process after he arrived, and I'm sure I attended uh, the trial where he was the judge. So while I didn't get to know him well, I did spend some time with him. And it seems to me we might have even had lunch. Where Bill and Hillary had organized it, but I might have been there. But in any event, I had met him through that process, and I had known much of John Doerr before that day, obviously. He was one of my great heroes. Um, you know, I uh, grew up in Beaumont, as I stated, which was completely segregated. Um, I started school in 1954, the year of the Brown decision, but the schools in Beaumont were not integrated until after my graduation. I finished in 66, probably in 68. Um, and so I was very much aware of the role that John Doerr had played uh, with escorting um, <clears throat> My goodness, the name is slipping from me right now. But the University of Mississippi encounter where Ross Barnett was uh, trying to uh, prohibit the enrollment of James Meredith, I guess it was. I knew of John Doerr's role in the incident after um, uh, Medgar Evers had been shot, um, his involvement with the Freedom Riders, uh, and I gather he was also a consultant on the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which made all the difference in the world for me. Um, I don't know what my life would have been, but without the Civil Rights Act of 64, it certainly would have been very different from what it was. Uh, for um, much younger people watching this, could you unpack that a little bit for us, please? Well, uh, I grew up in a completely segregated society. It was not an unhappy childhood by any means, but it was completely black neighborhood, all black school, uh, black students, black faculty, black administrators. Uh, at the time that I enrolled at SMU, I think that I probably knew by name no more than eight whites. I knew my father's boss. I knew a track coach at at Lamar University because I was a shot putter also. And he had a son who was a shot putter. So I came to know him. We did not have a cement circle at my high school. I had to kind of dig out a shot putting circle with a shovel. And when I was preparing to go to the state meet, uh, Coach Terrell at Lamar invited me to come over to Lamar to practice. Uh, with his son, so I got to know him. I knew the superintendent of schools. I knew the athletic director for the school district, and I knew a few people that worked with my father. But uh, it was just a completely segregated society at that point. Um, with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, things started to change in a significant way. As I mentioned, I started uh, college at SMU in 1966, uh, being the second year that black students were um, recruited there. That was pretty much true of most major Southern schools. And um, so the fact that the Civil Rights Act had been passed, and then the Voting Rights Act in 65, was really the beginning of significant change in race relations in the South. And I was very optimistic about the changes that were expected to occur and was pretty much uh, convinced that I was going to return to Texas after law school for my 
legal and whatever career was to follow. Well, it was as a result of the relationship between Burt Marshall and John Doerr. As you well know, John Doerr worked for Burt Marshall when the Civil Rights Division in the John Kennedy administration, and they were very close personal friends. I don't really know what conversation took place, but I received a call from John um, in very early January or late December after he had been uh, hired as counsel and uh, he indicated to me that I had been recommended by Burt Marshall. He spoke to me about whether I had taken a position with respect to uh, President Nixon's impeachment and I indicated that I had not. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, the inquiry with a, with, that would be upcoming. And after our discussion for about 15 to 20 minutes, he did offer me a position and asked if I could be up there very early the next week. That was on a Saturday morning. Um, I had, um, I referred to my girlfriend early on who had been my girlfriend since 10th grade and, going to SMU with me, and because I made the Yale decision so late in the process, it was too late for her to apply uh, to the biochemistry department, and Brown uh, was a school that did accept her application late. Um, <coughs> but uh, in any event, she had a year of graduate, she did two years at Brown, two years at Yale. And um, she had a year remaining uh, when when uh, I graduated, I had clerked for Baker Botts in Houston after my second year in law school and had a very good experience and uh, was prepared to go back to Baker Botts on a permanent basis. But because my wife had a year of, law, uh, of graduate school remaining, I decided that I didn't want to leave her for a year and I would go to New York and see what that experience was like, so I joined Paul Weiss. And I had been practicing with Paul Weiss about six months at the time that John Doerr called. Um, we, my wife and I, discussed that weekend the possibility of my taking that position. Uh, we decided I should. I went to New York on Monday and resigned from Paul Weiss, and I think I was in Washington on either Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, I had a wonderful experience at Paul Weiss, but one of the things that that opportunity did provide was a smooth transition from New York to Houston, which would have been very difficult because I had a very positive experience at Paul Weiss in New York, but I really thought that uh, I would like to go back to Texas and the changes I expected to see occur there. But in any event, that's how I came to be in Washington, and I was one of the earlier hires to arrive. There were some who uh, came a little bit earlier, and I think some uh, had gone to work for the committee before John was hired, but uh, I was one of the early arrivals. I can't remember the date, but very early in January. What duties did they give you? Well, initially, John was trying to put together a staff, so I did a lot of reviewing of resumes and interviewed a couple of people. Obviously, I wasn't making a final decision since I was a six-month six lawyer at the time, but I did do some initial review, uh, reviews of uh, resumes that came in and interviewed a, a few people, so that was kind of my first undertaking. Uh, I think after that, um, John was assisting the committee in uh, the process of getting authorization for the inquiry by the Judiciary Committee. And John asked me to kind of outline uh, 
um, the points that should be made by the congressman on the floor in connection with that. And I don't remember whether he asked me to make little speeches outline it, and I don't know whether it was used, but I remember working for a period of time on that. Um, then I believe that while I, my title was special assistant, there were two of us that had that title, David Haynes and myself. So we weren't assigned to a task force. Uh, our uh, assignments were much more fluid. And early on, I think before Joe Wood arrived, who was in charge of the constitutional, uh, I think they called it constitutional legal issues, but trying to define what an impeachable offense was. But before John, uh, I mean, Joe arrived and uh, John Leibowitz also worked on that ultimately. I think he wrote the uh, memorandum on what an impeachable offense was. But very early on, John asked me just to do some preliminary research on what an impeachable offense might be. Uh, so I did a little work on that, but once Hillary and Joe and John arrived, um, they had complete responsibility for that. Uh, I would mention that uh, uh, since David Haynes and I both had the special assistant uh, title and David was three or four, even possibly five years more senior than I was and uh, had clerked for Chief Justice Berger and so I kind of looked at him as, uh, as kind of a senior associate. And I, so quite often he asked me to assist him with whatever he was doing. And sometimes John would give me assignments directly. Sometimes he would ask me to assist David with something that he'd asked David to work on. Um, so there were various discrete assignments that I was given. Um, over the course of, of the uh, nine months, approximately, that I was there. Let's, ask, let's talk about a few of the sort of elements of the challenge that Mr. Dorr faced and see if we can talk to you about them. Um, when he arrives, he has to get to know um, the Watergate Special Prosecution Force. And he's working with Jaworski, and he's working with an old colleague, Henry Ruth. Um, did he, did he share with you some of the discussions that he was having with them um, about, about the nature of impeachment? Um. Not in any great depth. I was aware that uh, John and Henry Ruth had a relatively close relationship, and I knew that he had known uh, Mr. Jaworski from some prior experience. I was aware that his view, that John's view, was that the special prosecutor, by virtue of the nature of its assignment, was looking for a crime. And I think John's view was more a review of uh, behavior over a long period of time, that the cumulative uh, effect, reviewing the effect of cumulative behavior over a period of time. So I think the difference largely related to John's view of the role of uh, a special prosecutor versus the role of one conducting an impeachment inquiry. Do you think that, uh, that, that he came to this uh, position, at least when you came to work with him, with a sense of the importance of the pattern of Well, I, you know, it's been 45 years, so it's very difficult to remember timelines. But I think fairly early on, John started to develop the view that uh, it was cumulative behavior that would make the determination as to whether there was a case or not. 
I don't think John came in with any preconceived notion of whether an impeachable offense had occurred. I think his view was very much, we were not there to make a case, we were there to determine whether there was a case. And uh, uh, I think he made a determination fairly early on that we would not conduct an independent investigation, that we would depend in large part on work that had been done by the Senate Select Committee and some other committees that had um, looked into some of the relevant issues. Uh, but I think it was fairly early on that John came to believe that there had been a pattern of conduct that needed to be looked into and uh, explained uh, and that was the way I think he approached uh, the inquiry. And I'm sure he was impacted by the views of Chairman Rodino and, um, and Mr. Hutchinson and others on the committee, but I was not party to those discussions. And Did he share with you at all Well, we did not have very many extended discussions regarding issues of that kind, but because, as I indicated earlier, I so admired John for what he had done when he was involved in the Civil Rights Division. I did speak with him at times about his approach with respect to some of the matters that he looked into there. I, yes, he tried the case of Goodman, Cheney, and Swerner, and uh, I certainly came away from, with, uh, from those discussions with uh, the view that uh, in that very hostile atmosphere that it was terribly important to be meticulous, thorough, and impartial in conducting investigations and being certain that uh, any, any allegations that were made were almost indisputable. And um, so I think that his approach toward this investigation was probably similar to the approach that he'd taken with respect to uh, incidents that were investigated or cases in the South. Um, he was very much of the view that many of the, that the allegations being made in the statements of information either be supported by sworn testimony or by documents. So they were basically undisputed facts that were put forward uh, in, the, in the investigation. And, and John, as you probably know, was somewhat uh, skeptical or suspicious of computers. And I think that approach of using the index cards that uh, was used in connection with the investigation was similar to what he had done uh, in his civil rights cases. I, I got that impression. I, I'm not positive of that, but I think that's where that idea came from and this idea of organizing them in a chronological fashion. Um, so I'm sure that his experience uh, at the Civil Rights Division influenced the way that, that he approached the inquiry. Um, did, uh, did, Mr. Rod did Mr. Doerr ever tell you the story of, uh, of Jack Brooks's anger that uh, you were uh, recruited from Beaumont without him having been involved? Well, uh, he didn't have to tell me. Um, I think that John brought Jack Brooks to my office expecting that he would be pleased that I was from Beaumont, an area he represented, and uh, Mr. Brooks let John know in my presence that he was not pleased that I had been hired from his district without his approval.
Well, I was not aware of that. Uh, I know he expressed his displeasure that day in my office, and he may have had discussions with John subsequent to that, but my relationship with Jack Brooks became quite good over the period that I was there, so I'd assume that the issue had been disposed of. He made his point that if anyone from his district was hired, he wanted to know about it, and John, I think, acknowledged that that's the way he would proceed. If, but I think the staff was pretty much fully uh, employed by that time, so I don't think it was really an issue. But uh, I don't, I did not perceive that John had any great problem with uh, Mr. Brooks' uh, requirement that that be the case. And as I said, over the nine months, I developed a very good relationship with with the congressman. Did you? Not up close in very many instances, but I, it was clear from the way that John spoke of, of Mr. Rodino that he had developed a tremendous respect for him. And certainly when I saw him uh, conducting a, the few hearings that I did attend or other meetings, I was very impressed with the way that he conducted the investigation. Uh, he was very impartial. Uh, he tried to be as fair as he possibly could, was my impression. And he conducted the hearings with great dignity, I thought. Um, and everything I heard John say about Mr. Rodino was very, very positive. And so I'm certain that he had a very high regard for him. I was aware that that was an issue. I was not directly involved with that, but because uh, John Doyle was so insistent that <coughs> the confidentiality of the process be maintained and that we not speak with anybody outside of the staff, there was a great deal of informal discussion among staff members. So I was aware that Hillary was working on procedures for the hearings, and I knew that one of the issues was what role that Mr. St. Clair would play in the hearings, and I think that ultimately he was given a fairly broad role, and I think that he was involved in uh, questioning some of the few witnesses that were ultimately called. Um, I know he was very much taking the position that there had to be a crime which was at variance with, with John's view. Um, but that's about all I know about that. Do you recall the, the discussion about whether or not there should be witnesses at all that came in before the entire committee? Yes, uh, early on, I, don't, I think that John did not expect to conduct an independent investigation at all. And I think that was largely as a result of the time limit that were involved and that the select committee had accumulated so much material that he thought that, that uh, the investigation, the inquiry could be completed if we were to organize and uh, synthesize the information that was currently, that was then available. Um, and I don't know how the idea of calling some witnesses came about I seem to have some recollection that some committee members very much wanted that uh, to occur. And um, I also seem to remember, because I was involved in some way with either John Mitchell's uh, interview with John Doerr and Mr. Jenner, or his appearance uh, as a witness, um, and that it may have been Mr. Sinclair who um, 
was interested in having Mr. Mitchell testify. I, I remember something like that, but I don't remember the details. You said it's been a long time. It has been a long uh, time. What do you remember of Mr. Jenner? Oh, he was just a prince of a gentleman. Uh, and I really developed a, a pretty close relationship as well. I used to just go to his office and speak with him at times. In fact, uh, I mentioned earlier that I had always been pretty much determined to return to Texas, but Mr. Jenner had invited me to join his firm in Chicago, and I really gave some thought to that because I thought so much of Burt Jenner. Ultimately, I went a lot, uh, continued to think that my future was in Texas, but uh, it was some indication of how highly I thought of him that I seriously thought of gave consideration of going to Chicago. Um, uh, Mr. Jenner and Mr. Doerr, I understand, were a great team. They were. They were different individuals. Could you give us a bit of a word picture of uh, how, uh, first of all, please describe Mr. Jenner to those who wouldn't know what he was like. Well, first, he was <clears throat> one of the great trial lawyers of his era, uh, and Obviously, by virtue of his name being the first name in Jenner and Block, one of the great law firms in Chicago, and I think he had been president of the, of the American Bar Association or held some other high office. So he was uh, nationally recognized as one of the leading trial lawyers in the country. And uh, he was extremely personable, articulate, he knew how to, obviously, uh, like so many trial lawyers, they, they have this drawing personality. And uh, he was a very gregarious man. He was something of a uh, natty dresser. He, had, he used to wear socks that were unusual for the time, as I recall. Um, so uh, he was just a wonderful man. He was a great storyteller. He was a lot of fun to be around. John was a great leader, a great man with tremendous judgment and integrity. And, but he was very self-effacing. And, uh, and he was not, he didn't lead by being one of the boys. Uh, he was, uh, he was certainly a very, very nice man. It was fun to be around him, but he was relatively quiet. He was not um, a very voluble personality, and uh, in that way was somewhat different from, from Burt Jenner. Um, what was the environment like for members of the staff? You were describing how important it was uh, to, to maintain confidence in everybody. Well, one thing that made it much easier was there was not a lot of time away from work to be exposed to the questions that were ultimately raised by outsiders when, uh, when in their presence. We worked very, very long hours. Uh, I, there were many days we worked 16, 17 hours, um, and particularly when the hearings were going on, it was almost constant. But John had so clearly made the point that we were not to discuss what uh, was being done outside of, of the staff. I think it just resulted in close relationships developing within the staff. As I mentioned, there were five of us from Yale who were already friends. Tom Bell, who uh, was a very uh, significant member of the staff, he was had a, the liaison with the select committee and uh, John, I mean Tom, shared an office with Hillary. Um, Lee Dale, I believe, uh, shared an office with, uh, shared a suite with Mike Conway, who was a good friend of mine. So I came to know them very well. And Larry Lucchino, uh, you know, ultimately became the president of the Boston Red Sox. And, was very involved in baseball. He was a really great guy who I'd known at Yale. And, um, 
So not only did I develop friendships, but I developed friendships with their, the people they had developed relationships with on the staff. So it was a, it was a very close-knit group, and we used to have a lot of informal discussions around the, in the office space, and we'd often, I don't remember what restaurants or anything, but we used to get together and go out to eat in little groups when, uh, well, not so little at times, when uh, the time line worked out with uh, the assignments of the various staff members. My recollection is that I listened to at least one tape, and I may have listened to a couple of others, but I was not very much involved with, with the tapes, and I've forgotten why I listened to the one that I'm pretty sure that I did. You know, there was so much discussion of the tapes that, uh, my memory is really not vivid regarding what I heard and what I heard discussed. Uh, but I certainly didn't listen to very many of the tapes, I'm sure of that. Um, as we're getting into July of 1974, um, Mr. Doris, given his, uh, his presentation of the state's statements of information, uh, and there is a question as to whether Well, again, I'm not sure that I, well, I'm positive I never had a direct discussion with John about that, but my sense was that there had been some impatience on the part of some member members with the process, the way the process had worked, because this, I guess it was over six weeks that the uh, statements of information were read to the committee and I think John's approach was to read that in a very methodical way, and I think probably the others who did some reading were instructed in the same fashion that this was to be um, an impartial president presentation of the, the uh, information, which was not called facts at the time. Uh, <coughs> and. I got the sense that some of the com com uh, committee members were looking for um, John to express his views at some point, and I guess that he, he was persuaded to do that. I'm not sure whether he had planned to do it all along, but I know that there was a great deal of, uh, a number of requests that he do that, and I know that he did ultimately elect to do it. Did you participate in any way in, in, in creating the summary of Well, uh, to some extent, I Other than Mr. Brooks. <laughs> no, I had a couple of conversation with Congressman Conyers. Uh, Barbara Jordan was from Houston and had been the uh, debate partner of a very good friend of mine when she attended Texas Southern University. Um, so uh, she became very friendly with me, and in fact, I guess her campaign manager uh, uh, was uh, also a Texas Southern graduate who was a very good friend of mine. So um, uh, we shared a few relationships, and I obviously knew what a tremendous role she would played as a politician in Texas, being the first black congressperson elected since Reconstruction. So I admired her a great deal and came to know her a little bit in connection with the process. I think those were the two that I uh, spoke with 
more than any others. I may have had a few conversations with others, but they were very limited. Did she uh, share with you the, the fact that she was uh, on the fence about impeachment? She wasn't sure which way she was going to go? We really didn't discuss that. I think I have subsequently heard that that was the case. Um, but uh, I do remember the eloquent speech that she gave during the debates, and I guess by that time she had uh, come to some conclusion. But I have heard or read that that was a period when she was not certain. Um, what do you remember of Dick Case? Oh, again, Dick was just a, an amazing man. He was just a great storyteller. He was very folksy very animated, uh, and again, I developed a very good relationship with Dick, and Dick was, I'm not sure exactly what his title was, but he was very much one of the senior people and seemed to be involved in all the big decisions that were made, and he um, had uh, such a, I think that he may have been hired by the committee uh, before Doerr arrived. And so it probably as a result of that, he had relationships with the committee. And I think Congressman Kastenmeyer was from Wisconsin, and they had known each other uh, for some time. Um, but Dick seemed to have a very good relationship with a number of the committee members. and. I gather that he used to meet with them, and what the staff used to refer to as uh, uh, sessions when they would sort of be uh, spoken. They would receive in more detail what had been provided in the statements of information. And, and I think they relied a great deal on Dick when they had questions. The, as the process was building to the uh, to the dates, um, did you have a sense of which way you thought this would go? Um, did you um, did you participate at all, for example, in shaping the articles of impeachment that Mr. Doerr drafted? Well, I my role in that was very small. You know, John told me early on he liked the way I wrote because I wrote very succinctly and tried to write with some clarity. So from time to time he'd ask me to look over something that he had written or he'd received, but I was really not involved in the drafting of the articles. Uh, but from information that I had uh, kind of either heard or reading between the lines as to what I did here. My, I was not at all certain of what the, what the vote was going to be. I know that both John and from what John said, to Mr. Rodino very much wanted the vote to be nonpartisan, whether it was a positive vote or a negative vote. Um, I had heard uh, from various sources that there were some of the Republicans on the committee that wanted consideration of a possible censure rather than impeachment. Um, and I knew that there were some of the Republicans on the committee that were uh, very opposed to the idea of impeachment. So exactly where it all was, I, I was not certain. I did believe that based upon the accumulated information, there was uh, a sound basis for impeachment, but whether the committee was going to come to that conclusion, I, I just didn't know. Did you have any uh, opportunity to interact with uh, the three Southern Democrats, uh, Thornton, May, or Flowers on the committee? No. Not directly. I think that I was present doing some of the debate and 
heard their statements and I, from some other sources, was pretty much aware of uh, the difficult decision that they were facing on the point. I did not get the sense that, um, at least in the case of Mr. Flowers, and I'm not sure about the others, but I knew that it was, my sense was that it was Mr. Sandman and Mr. Wiggins who uh, were very, very opposed, at least at, until after the smoking gun to, to uh, impeachment. Well, on July 26, uh, Sandman, uh, Congressman Sandman and uh, Congressman Wiggins went after the draft of Article One of the Construction of Justice Department and wanted specificity. specificity. And that night, uh, the staff went into overdrive to provide assistance to Yeah, I think Mike Conway was very much involved in drafting, in revising, um, well, in accumulating the, spec the specifics that uh, Mr. Sandman had uh, requested. But I think that there was the way that the cards were organized with the support behind the, uh, the statements of information, I think that that those specifics were pretty readily available. It was a question of just pulling them together and providing them. Not that I'm understating the importance of that and certainly doing it in, on the kind of time schedule that was required, uh, but I was aware of that, yes. The next day, July 27th, the first article was passed by a bipartisan majority. What do you remember of your reaction? Well, as I indicated, I think that uh, the facts very much supported the article. So I was glad to see at that point that, that, that the committee had agreed because I think the staff had done a thorough, meticulous, impartial job of pulling together the facts and I thought the facts spoke for themselves. So it was not surprising to me that they reached that conclusion. I didn't know, I can't say that I had a real sense in advance of how it might go, but I can't say that I was overly surprised that that was the vote. Um, after three articles pass and two were rejected, um, what do you think your next Well, I don't know what would have happened on a, with a full House vote. I think that uh, the debates had been handled with such dignity and such sincerity by the, the uh, staff members, um, by the, uh, the committee members. Uh, I think that they conveyed their confidence in the way that the inquiry had been conducted by John and the staff, so I thought that their vote would be very persuasive in the House, but uh, while I expected that uh, the House would approve at least some of the, uh, the articles, I, certainly, I was not certain about what was going to transpire and John had really not spoken to me about what he expected me to do, so I, I was just prepared to do whatever he asked. Um, do you remember uh, when the Supreme Court, in an 8-0 decision, um, uh, went against the, the President and U.S.B. Nixon? Your, your reaction to that decision? Well, I was very pleased to see that. Um, obviously, it was a very tense time, and I think there had been some, I think the president had not answered the question as to whether or not he would uh, comply with uh, a Supreme Court decision on the issue, and I think 
Mr. Sinclair had not addressed the issue directly either. Um, so uh, I knew that, that it could result in some kind of constitutional crisis depending upon what the Supreme Court did rule. And I remember also that there seemed to be some stories around about a kamikaze flight into the Capitol or something. I, I, don't, I don't recall, but I, I, um, I do remember that it obviously raised the possibility of a, a real constitutional crisis. Um, uh, again, I think that my view is consistent with that of uh, the other members of the, st the senior people who were making the decisions that um, executive privilege should not protect the materials that had been subpoenaed by the committee as well as uh, the subpoenas of uh, the special prosecutor. Um, and I guess that um, Judge Sirica and the appellate court had already ruled um, in favor of the uh, compliance of, with these subpoenas. So I guess I wasn't overly surprised about where the Supreme Court came out. Um, and I thought it was the correct decision. Well, I certainly was aware that there had been a lot of discussion about the fact that some of the Republican members were concerned about a Senate trial having an impact on the midterm elections, um, and that as a result of that, there might be some pressure on the president to resign rather than having a trial uh, linger on for, for months, particularly if um, the head count or whatever was done in the Congress seemed to show that the House was clearly going to vote for impeachment and if there was not pretty strong assurances that there would uh, be an exoneration, or at least not a conviction in the Senate, that there might be a lot of pressure on the president to resign. But I had no idea of what might happen. The president had given strong indications that he would never resign, and uh, he's a very he was a very strong-willed man. So I had no idea of what might happen. Um, do you have some stories you want to share with us? Well, it was a very talented group that worked, very collegial group. Everybody worked very well to, uh, together. Uh, I thought it was very fortunate to have uh, four other Yale people that I had known for years and having an opportunity to work with, with them so closely. I was very proud of the fact that uh, our staff did work in such an um, impartial fashion, particularly that we were able to protect the confidentiality of that whole process as well as we were able to. Um, I thought the work that we did was intellectually rigorous because John demanded that in part, but also because we had uh, lawyers on the staff that uh, were also very talented and very proud professionals who wanted to do um, uh, a very judicious job. Um, <clears throat> and John provided such great leadership that we all knew what was expected. But our senior people, I mean, uh, Bernie Nussbaum and Joe Wood 
Dick Cates and Evan Davis and, uh, and uh, Gil were all just tremendous lawyers. And being uh, six months out of law school, I felt that I learned so much about how really good lawyers functioned and particularly working with John. Um, so it was just a, a tremendous experience. And um, so I was just very pleased to have had the opportunity to be involved with a historically important event and to work with such great people and particularly to have an opportunity to work with a hero of mine who I came away with even a more positive view of than I had based upon what I'd read about him. Um, so it was, it was a very good experience and a very difficult time for the country. Um, what, uh, if, if any, lessons did you learn about impeachment, the process from your experience on, on the stand? Well, um, I certainly came away with a greater appreciation of our Constitution. Um, I think that also gained a greater understanding of the vulnerabilities of our system. Um, I don't know what would have happened had the tapes been destroyed. Um, I think that there were many things in that uh, could be established outside the tapes. Um, many of the senior uh, members of the president's staff had extensive notes that were not relied on to the extent that they might have been had we not had the tapes. But um, I think the tapes made a, rather, a lot of difference and who knows what would have happened without that. And uh, I think the fact that the result that came out of the inquiry and the vote of the committee certainly validated, um, I think, the requirements of the Constitution. And I think that anyone in power would have to take into consideration what happened as a result of that inquiry and it should have some impact on their um, determination to comply with the Constitution and their oath of office. No, I can't think of anything. I, um, I guess one of the antidotes not only was the story of, of um, Hillary telling uh, Bernie Newsbaum that Bill would one day be President of the United States, and I think the next day there were a group of us around the coffee bar somewhere, and Bernie came up laughing at what Hillary had told him the night before about Bill being president. I guess my reaction, I didn't say anything, was that uh, there are a number of fortuities that will determine whether any person becomes president of the United States. But among all of the people of our era I knew or had read much about that if anybody did, it was going to be Bill Clinton. Um, also remember well that uh, on my modest salary on the uh, inventory staff, I had uh, leased three apartments. Uh, my wife had a year of graduate school remaining in New Haven, and I had gone to work at Paul Weiss in New York, so we uh, leased an apartment for a year in Stamford, Connecticut. And when I moved to Washington, obviously, I needed a place to live in Washington. And my wife indicated that uh, she was not pleased about having to drive 50 miles every day back to New Haven when I was no longer there. So she leased a little place in New Haven. 
So on roughly 20000 a year, I was paying rent on three apartments. Uh, so um, that was interesting. Um, and as I said, um, the experience did allow me a nine-month period to make a final decision as to whether I would return to New York or go to Houston and go to work for Baker Box, where it had the very positive summer experience after my second year. Um, so um, everything about the experience, except having to pay the rent on three apartments, was, uh, was really fantastic. Mr. Cormier, thank you for your time today. Well, thank you. Wonderful. My pleasure.